we're back again, Julio and John. I like totally again, like naive with this stuff. I feel like I know a little bit more now, but we have more questions and we're going over how we actually train neural nets. So Julio, I'm going to ask you maybe uh, a few questions and hopefully I'll understand enough of the answers to come up with additional questions, but it's great okay. to see you. And happy to be back and I'm ready to go. <laughs> great. Okay, so let's get to it. What happens to a neural net um, during training? Okay, so last time we saw neural network has a lot of little parameters inside. And training the networks, it me means to adjust the values of these parameters so that the, the function, the big function that is a network produces the output that you want. So input in, you check the output, and you adjust the parameters. Gotcha. So it's kind of like storing the values of those parameters. But like, what does that have to do with kind of the layers? How do things get saved within those? Let me show you one thing from, from Timmy's blog. This is a typical example of the, of the networks that, that he has inside. Uh, so this is the chain. This contains five layers. And where are these parameters? Well, these red things means that these, these layers, they are not trained. They, 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 need, uh, they need to adjust the, the parameter values. And you see that you have some arrays inside, these weights, biases. So this, this layer here takes one, a vector of one number and makes it a vector of four number with this matrix, matrix multiplication. And, and you have so one array here, one array here. Then you have some layers with no parameters. And then another layer with parameters, you can mix and match them, but they are stored together with, with, the, with the layer definition. Does it make sense to you? Yes, it makes marginal sense. I think I'll have to rewatch the video again to get it. Okay. <laughs> but thank you. Okay, so can we change these layers that exist during, during the training? No, John, you cannot. The only thing that can be updated are the parameters here inside the layer. So if you want to, to try with a different architecture or a different structure, you need to set it up and do a separate training and then compare the results. And this is how it's typically done. Okay, so this is like one of those major differences because when I think of like human training, there's like plasticity in, in, in that regard, but you're saying there's like no plasticity here. We can't change and move these layers around. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct in a sense, because what you can do is to create a, like a lot more connection that is needed and then hope that during the training, some of these connections, they, they kind of get set to zero. But this is very expensive. You're doing many more operations than what you would need. So if you want to use an optimized structure, then yeah, you, you, you give up on the kind of the complete freedom and you impose a specific, uh, a specific uh, architecture on, on the network. Gotcha, gotcha. So I've heard of like kind of fine tuning. Is that something that maybe takes the place of that sort of plasticity? Okay, so fine tuning is, yeah, is, is related in a sense. You, like when I say that you have to create a new architecture and train from scratch, that I kind of left out this part. Another thing you can do, you can take an existing model and uh, Either continue training on or with a different task, like a more specific task, like you want to reinforce specific type of results, or you can, you know, for example, change, uh, let's say layer five here, we can change it with another one that gives two numbers or three numbers instead of one, because the problem is slightly different. So if, um, if I know that the, the, a big part of my problem stays the same, I can leverage that. And, uh, and then I can like, kind of freeze and stop in time some of the parameters and only change others. Gotcha. And how how does that relate to um, some of the services that are out there that we see? Um, what sort of stuff do they execute with their their training? Do they use people to help train them? How, how does that, that continue? That's correct. So, for example, uh, to go from uh, GPT three to Chat GPT, what happened is that was this big model trained to predict text as we saw um, like last time. And, um, and what they did was like also to um, 
kind of ask people to score these predicted uh, uh, texts, these answers, and then train the model to kind of match the highest, uh, the, the, the choices that would give the highest possible score. So this would kind of steer the, the result of a model in specific di direction that you, you know, you can, uh, you, you can, you can have, have it use a certain tone or, or like kind of focus on certain, certain uh, type of answers that, that you want, you want it to, to give or, 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 or to, to generate. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting and makes it like almost you're involved in making things better. Yeah, that's that's called. Uh, I don't know if you've heard that. That's called reinforcement learning, and uh, this is reinforcement learning with human in the loop. So you you have these human beings. That, that, that re typical reinforcement learning is done uh, with some sort of external word that is telling you you are doing good, you are doing bad, and often is a simulation or something like that. So in this case, you have real humans saying this is good, this is bad, and uh, and then the, the model gets better at kind of. Uh, um being appreciated by by us okay so the the reinforcement sort of training seemed really kind of advanced maybe you could show me some examples of training to see like more of how things work in in practice mm -hmm. Is that... okay great sure uh, what about this network here that we have so as i said this is a simple Function that takes a real number and gives a real number in output. Yeah, so any any problem like that will will do. Um, let's try this one for example. So this is a sim very simple problem. It's like a, um, a parabola. So mm -hmm. I'm just assigning my network to a variable. I'm defining some random numbers for my my input, and my output is going to be x squared minus one minus a half. Like simple simple parabola. So yeah, I'm plotting it. So what what training this means is that I'm, as I said before, we are adjusting the parameters value. So here I put some code that will kind of show you what what it what it means. So you see, this is the initial network, and these are the values of the of the output at each layer, and the arrows represent the the, the color of the arrow is is uh, the parameter value. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in this other one, this is a live version. So like this right now, this is training. And you see that these parameters value are changing and the output values that you see in numbers are changing and the final result is changing to match actually what, what this is. So this is, we're trying to train the neural net to create that parabola. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's true. So, so let, what's, yeah. the, what's the number? That's kind of accumulating there at the bottom. Like what, oh, what is this? Yes. This is do you see this absolute batch? This is counting. Like I'm not showing all my training examples to the network. Also, because like for I mean this case I could, it's very simple. But for very complicated networks, um it's a lot, it's like terabytes. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna show them in batches. And that number is counting how many batches the network has seen so far. Hmm. So yeah, that's that's the idea. So now what does the output of the neural network look like? Is it gonna get close to that parabola? Well, let's try. Let's try. So we can do something like a list plot of uh, we transpose x and oh I didn't save it to a variable, so let's say trained. Trained. Is going to be this. And now what we can do is we can do trained of x. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, that's that's probably better than I can draw freehand, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but I can show you if you want, if you're curious about the output, I mm -hmm. can try to show you live. What's going on while you are training this? Yeah, I mean that's. Can sounds... I see that? Yes. Okay, so here I change my progress reporting function. So you see, like all these orange dots are the subset of points that the network is seeing, and the mm -hmm. more it sees them, the more it adjusts to the to the desired output. Mm -hmm. So in this case, is this network is not big enough to kind of learn the this um, soft curve, but it's mm -hmm. trying the, the the best it can. Right. 
so how many like how many of those training um training data would it need to actually replicate the parabola perfectly could it like in some cases will it just never replicate it even if it's even if it saw you know millions and millions and millions of of points correct so um, this is a piecewise function yeah i'm using the ram function to add some no linearity to this but this is the piecewise linear function with the with mm. this kind of like right so if i want to learn something like this i need a lot more layers or like bigger layers to kind of work around that thing right so it's a limitation if i understand it's like a limitation of the model itself yes that's that's true if you want something like super advanced we can try a slightly different model and see what happens okay okay so let me let me type something here explicitly so we can say you know something that takes uh, has like again like four layers but ton h instead of ramp then again four layers ton h and then we have put a real number let's see what's going on now okay so this is softer mm -hmm. and now it's learning yeah it's okay it's too though it's getting there but you see at the end it saturates yeah. with the hyperbolic tangent instead of saturating with the with the um, identity, which is ramp. It saturates with hyperbolic tangent. So yeah, this network is still too small, kind of to completely overcome the the structure, the the in, the, the um, shape imposed by the structure. But you see, now it's getting very close. Right. So in this case, like your model would really depend on where you needed to be, like where you needed to model the behavior. So if you're at the soft part, then maybe this model would work. And if you need the other part, maybe the other, another part of another model would work. Is that? Exactly. That's it. This is typically less of a problem for very, very big model because they, they have enough uh, uh, leg room to model basically everything. Awesome. That's really useful to see like it visually. <laughs> well, I hope so. This is this is what we try to build this framework for. <laughs> well, congrats. It's a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we saw those two models and it kind of converged on a solution, but how do we kind of decide about the new values for the parameters and like make those decisions over time? Okay, John, this is a minimization problem. Don't know if you're familiar with optimization. You we need to define a function uh, that basically will tell us how good we are doing. And this is the error function, or typically in the field is called loss function. Mm -hmm. And the training corresponds to the minimization of this loss function. So if I don't put anything custom and I just show you what's going on, you see like the more I add data and I, and I, and I do rounds, the, the, the more this function goes down. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. You so I'm assuming that it like we, we see that it keeps improving over time. Mm -hmm. um, what happens if it doesn't improve? Well, we see it here, for example. Yeah, now this has improved a lot at the beginning, mm -hmm. and then it's kind of slowing down. Mm -hmm. Then here I kind of like managed to find a kind of a, a way to, to get to a lower, uh, a lower error rate, uh, and it, it improved a bit more. But at a certain point, it will get stuck. So um, if it is stuck, there's, uh, you have two choices here, basically. The first one is like, you call it a day, you're happy. It is stuck because it just has learned enough of what it had to learn. Um, the second choice is uh, it didn't learn correctly your problem. And then you need to go back to the drawing board and like kind of prepare a better model. Got you, got you. So it's kind of like you'll, at some point, you're going to stop the training. And on one end, it could be you're satisfied with the results, like we saw with the really smooth model earlier, or mm -hmm. it could be that it just doesn't have the features that we want, and then we just start over. Correct. Gotcha. Awesome. I mean, that sounds like we've gone through like a broad area and had like some really great examples um to actually see training in action thanks so much julio for walking us through all of that stuff 
I, I think we have maybe a couple more sessions. So I'm looking I, forward. What? I'm I'm ready for more if you want to know more. And <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you enjoying this. Yeah, it's a great exploration. Then till till next time, I guess. <laughs> Bye, John. Bye.